Good morning, good evening, good good to who needs it. This month's long video is a bit different. It's about letting go. Just because you put a lot of time or energy into something, if it's ugly, if it's something you're not proud of, if it's something that doesn't make you happy, you don't have to hold on to it. I have friends who think I'm crazy when I throw out old drafts or projects and who are always clutching their pearls that I've deleted old videos or straight up tossed things in a dumpster. But just because I cared about something before doesn't mean that I have to carry it with me now. If it isn't doing anything for me, if it's just dead weight, I can put it down. I don't necessarily like the phrasing of that because it feels transactional and I have been the brunt of many transactional relationships. I was always the person who does too much. Scream at me and I'd apologize, hit me and I'd minimize it, cheat on me and I'd take psych classes on infidelity and attachment theory. I would do anything for it to not be my fault when a relationship fell apart. I'm definitely not a person who walks away easily, but I am someone who has had to learn that if I know my needs aren't or won't get met, I can walk away. I've had friends, I'll, I'll tell you about one friend in particular. She used to get so upset and inform me how I didn't like her enough. Every time I saw her, I wasn't paying enough attention. I was talking too much to other people at the party. I wasn't smiling enough. I wasn't going places with her often enough. It didn't matter what my job was, what was going on in my life. I wasn't enough and she wanted to let me know that so that I could know that she was clearly the victim. Your friends aren't there to serve you. If you miss someone, invite them somewhere. If you feel like someone is drifting away, ask some open-ended questions. Don't tell them how you feel, what you think, what you've decided for them. Spending every second with them criticizing them is not going to strengthen your relationship. For all that person complained that I was never around, never doing enough, never at enough events, I can't think of a single time she ever asked me how I was doing. The answer would have been bad. I was working But that's not what mattered to her. What mattered was how she perceived it affecting her. And then she victimized me for her feelings about my apparent failures. I'm seeing this as a recovering mind reader. People who think they're good at reading people almost never are. What ends up happening is that the person they criticize repeatedly for X, apparent failing, either stops talking to them, validating their belief that that person was malicious or negligent, or the person panics and tries to make amends for things that they haven't actually done, which tells the nagging friend that they were right. It's not that they're good at reading people, it's that they manipulate people into acting within their own internal narrative. It's just a form of codependency. Let people be wrong about you. It is better to walk away and let them be wrong. So in my day job, I'm a trauma specialist. I've done a lot of work with victims of abuse and with perpetrators. I've been on the stand in court more times than I can count. This gives people an impression of me and I fully embrace that impression that my job is calling people out for a living. When you specialize in trauma and work for about six to 10 years, <laughs> depending uh, on which job, specifically with personality disorders, it makes people think that you're a hard ass, but I'm not. I used to tell people that my job was seeing a car drive by and pointing at it and saying car. But let me tell you, some cars do not like being pointed at. Thinking about how you contribute to the harm in other people's lives is difficult and necessary to growing as a person. If you let yourself get stuck in past relationships, past friendships, past acquaintanceships, purely out of a sense of duty and time spent on them, those are not going to be relationships that grow. You have to be willing to grow with others or in spite of them, because dead branches will kill a tree. If someone can't respect your boundaries, your limits, your personhood, I'm especially going to talk about personhood, then they aren't someone you can repair and move forward with. So, personhood. This is going to tie in to me talking a little bit about my favorite topic, personality disorders. Personality disorders are both under and over diagnosed because, believe it or not, everyone has a personality. 
People with what used to be called Cluster B personality disorders, however, those are egosystonic. Yes, they're this way. Yes, they've experienced negative consequences. Yes, they want things to change. You, they want you to change. You are what they want to change because they believe that they are doing everything just fine. Narcissists suffer. People with borderline personality suffer. People with antisocial personality suffer. But they're suffering so much that they reject the idea it could possibly be internally directed. You abandoned them. You said no. You didn't show up. You didn't read their mind. So you are the reason for the consequences that you face because of their meltdown. These are people more angry that you called the police when they were slamming doors, screaming, punching walls, breaking property, threatening to harm you. You are the bad guy because you tried to get help. Because the problem can never be them. But that doesn't mean that they aren't suffering. They go through life terrified of other people. Their meltdowns are the result of extreme dysregulation. They can't manage their own nervous systems. When you can't manage or control your own reactions and behavior, of course you feel like you're not the one at fault. So I understand. I understand better than anyone because my chief coping skill is intellectualizing absolutely everything. I understand why those people think I'm the asshole when I call them out for their behavior and hold them accountable. But my inherent fawn and fixed reflex, my need to intellectualize, is just enabling. That's why I keep having people like this in my personal life. It's why I'm so good at calling them out at work. I know these patterns all too well. Setting boundaries is a way of keeping people in your life, not shutting them out. It's telling someone, I care about you and this is what I need for us to be cool. If someone can't respect your boundaries, and worse than that, if they can't respect your personhood, your wholeness as an individual and not just the parts of you that intersect with them, you need to walk away. Because by letting go of those relationships, you hold on to yourself. You validate your own personhood, your wholeness, and you cannot heal or repair a relationship with someone who doesn't see you as whole or isn't willing to. It is okay to paint over a canvas and start over on the bones of who you were yesterday. Because that gives you the opportunity and possibility of creating something that you do actually like. Now, I feel like a lot of people could listen to the first half of this and think, maybe you are the asshole. Or worse, maybe they think that they're the asshole. You cut people out. I hear a lot of people especially people with older parents who they've had to set a limit with, struggling around this. I've had a client's father yell at me once that these boundaries are ruining my family. So I wanted to actually be helpful and talk about what is and is not a healthy boundary. Not a healthy boundary. You can't talk about how I hit you because people will start thinking I'm the bad guy. You can't tell people what I did to you. That should just be between us. Why do you keep talking about how I cheated on you? It's like you want me to feel bad. (laughs) Hearing about the ways that I'm abusive triggers me for abuse that I face that I've never talked about or processed and you should really respect not talking about it because it's really selfish of you to remind me that I'm also like that. It isn't a boundary to throw up in someone's face. You confronting me about my actions makes me feel bad. That's, That's just enforcing the belief that their feelings are more important than other people's. That's classic grandiosity. It's not necessarily narcissism, but it's a part of the greater pattern. It feels ridiculous to have to say it, but there's actually nothing you can do that makes it okay to abuse you. No minutia, no little jibe, no time you were sarcastic. Nothing that they throw up as an excuse is an appropriate excuse. There is never a reason to abuse someone. And you should be allowed to talk about it and heal from it. If someone isn't letting you heal, isn't listening, isn't working on repairing in sync with what you decide for you, if they decide what makes the problem resolved, you aren't the asshole. And if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, well, actually, it was abusive that they kept bringing up their needs after I cheated on them by asking me when we would start repairing things. Good good luck. Some examples of good boundaries. I don't like to be touched there. I would rather not talk about this issue with you that doesn't affect you directly. I don't want to discuss how I'm raising my child. That's between me and any co-parents or partners that I have. I'm not asking for advice about this. It's a personal decision. 
Please don't come to my house unannounced. If I'm not home, I can't stop everything and leave work just because you texted me. The things that make a good relationship are open communication and follow through. If you talk about everything and you get along fantastically on the surface, but no one follows through on enforcing those boundaries or checking in on them, no one follows through on promises or expectations, especially if those expectations are part of repair, if you just muscle through and smile, you don't actually have a good relationship. Boundaries are only any good if you can enforce them, so they have to be clear. Hey. I don't like when you minimize my experiences. What happens in therapy stays in therapy. If someone is saying that their therapist okayed or enabled a behavior, typically is just a manipulation. You don't know what the therapist has actually said or been told by the person, and it's likely just a tactic to make you feel ganged up on. All loss comes with some, some touch of grief. All trauma comes with some sort of grief. You know, not all, not all grief is traumatic, but all, all trauma is grief. Um, so at the start of the pandemic, I did a lot of research on grief, specifically because I had had multiple significant deaths in my life and because I had moved across the country and I was cut off from my support systems and it was agonizing to go through all of that alone. People who were in my life who were not choosing to be helpful, um, I had people who just very much let me down at that point in my life. And it went on to very negatively impact those relationships. <laughs> Bro, <laughs> the chick just walked so close to my car. Um, so that brings me to the first thing. And this is something that I learned in grief work. There's kind of an unwritten rule in grief. And I've talked about this a lot in like, journaling things I've done and educational pieces I've done. So if I've repeated this somewhere else, forgive me. But there's an unwritten rule of thirds. There are one third of people in your life who, when you are going through a very difficult time, a very difficult transition, a very difficult anything, are going to be... They're, they're not going to be. They're going to disappear. Um, But there are people who are not going to be helpful. There are people who are going to center themselves. <laughs> there are people who are going to to um, kind of go out of their way to continue victimizing you, who are going to go out of their way to make things worse because that's the pattern of behavior that they know and that they understand and that's what they're comfortable with. They're w comfortable with the chaos, so they're going to make chaos. And if the chaos is something that they can't control, maybe they're going to do something chaotic so that they can have control. And then it's not that they're being a bad friend or partner or parent because they are, you know, neglecting you during this time of need. It's that this other thing is happening. We have to address this. So that's one third. There's another third of people who are going to be kind of ambivalent. They don't really know how to respond to what you're going through. And they don't really know what to what to offer you or how to access their own emotions in a way that they can then you know, speak with you candidly. They're just, they're, they're not really sure what to do. And then there are the people who are going to be your third that come to the rescue. They are going to be the people that you realize are your best friends, the people that you realize are always going to have your back because they are going to not only, not only respond to you in a very supportive way, but they're going to respond in the supportive way that you need. So you have your thirds. And if, if, if you know, if you know that that's how it shakes out, how, for whatever reason, it, it's true <laughs> for whatever reason, that's how it shakes out. So if you know, going in, if you're like at the cusp of a new, new transition, a new part of life, and you're going into it, knowing that, okay, a third of people are going to be helpful. A third of people are going to not really know what to say. And a third of people are going to just suck. As terrible as some of your friends will take it, as terrible as some of your relations will take it, you have to know in your mind when you approach those people where you think they're going to fall. And everyone is going to process grief differently. George. George, what's your name, George? George, come back to me. 
So he coined the term coping ugly. I'm going to put it up here when I remember his name. So he coined the term coping If it's not George, I'm going to be sad. So he coined the term coping ugly. And it's the idea that when you are going through an incredibly stressful, traumatic event, and this is a paraphrase, of course, this is, this is you know, I'm, I'm, I'm condensing all this down. You are going to do things that under normal circumstances would be unhealthy. This is what your coping skills, this is what you have to go by. Um, so everyone is going to do different things to let go. And it may not be pretty and it may not be clean. Um, you just hope that it's not maladaptive. You hope that you're not doing something that's going to actually harm yourself or anybody else. <sighs> it was a bit rambling. But the idea is... It, it's different for everyone. It's going to take different forms. But that's part of the letting go process is finding what your form is. So my number one thing is knowing which group of people are going to fit in where. Because... The person who you open your heart up to may not be the person you want to go get a beer with because they're going to, this is going to turn into an emotional thing. You're going to spiral. So that's when you go into your number two. Those are your ambivalent friends. Those are your friends who don't know respond. You know, like this is your friend. This is top tier. This is like the person you're going to, you know, you're going to go to to cry on. And then it's like, I don't want to be in the, the crying mode right now. I want to go to the guy who's going to go to a bowling alley and get a white Russian. Because that's a normal thing that I know people who do that. <laughs> um, so that you, you're kind of like, I am, I'm just going to do the fun friend today. And we can do the deep friend later. And I'm going to avoid talking about anything serious if this person is present in the bottom tier. And, you know, we're going to kind of keep things level here. Um... Because knowing where people fit in and knowing how you're going to approach that and knowing what you're going to do with that, that's how you keep people in your life. That's how you, you keep people in your life that, you know, you might otherwise lose in, in the grief process. You know, every, every longevity study, every, everything about aging, about Alzheimer's, about uh, every degenerative disease... It all comes down to your inter interpersonal relationships and how strong they are and how well you communicate, which sounds ridiculous. And, and you know, people hear that and they're like, oh, I need to have more friends. You don't need more friends. You need good friends. <laughs> you need you need quality relationships because those those are actually shown. Um, once again, I'm blanking. I used to know all of these statistics and facts like the back of my hand. But, you know grief does fuck with your memory uh it's just a fun side effect but um and i've been through a lot um so i have to give myself grace with with the for getting side effects but so telomerase telomerase uh at the end of your uh chromosomes there's telomeres they're the little bloops at the end of the x's uh those fray over time and in people who have traumatic experiences, they fray at a higher rate. People who are caretakers of disabled children age, I believe it was, oh, I believe it was mothers of disabled children. And this was a study back in the 2000s, aged four times faster based on, you know, the, de the degradation of tel the telomeres at the end of their chromosomes. They age that much faster because the stress is that much greater on them. And the, the support systems are that much weaker. So we, and it's, what we've found though, is that it's reversible. Not completely. You're not going to stop aging. Sorry. But you can, through support systems, through support groups, through, you know, having your village, you can stop that degradation from becoming worse. You really want to build a strong community around you and you want to know where your boundaries are with them. Because that breaking things down into, into three groups, people might be like, hey, you're judging me. You're just setting boundaries. Boundaries are a way of keeping people in your life. It's not a way of shutting anyone out. It's a way of knowing where you are safe and telling people outright, this is what I got for you. Um... And that's really the best thing. 
Another thing. Number two. So that, that, all that. That's, you know, a nice, concise <laughs> grief lesson for you. Number two. Grief needs to be witnessed. So you do need to talk about it, but you don't need to talk about it in the way that you think you need to talk about it. People have this crazy misconception. This is my trauma therapist hat. People have this crazy ass misconception that if you have PTSD, or if you are going through a significant trauma, or you're going through a significant grief, or you're going through blah, 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 that you gotta talk about it. Talk about it. It helps to talk about it. Talk therapy changes the chemistry of your brain. Blah, blah, blah. This is all true. Um, but this Denny's parking lot is not the location for that to be taking place. So. Also, Stephanie, you don't know what you're talking about. So me talking about that here to you in this Denny's parking lot. I'm actually not in a Denny's parking lot. But it, me here talking to you in this Denny's parking lot. Uh, it's not gonna help. Not gonna help. Talking to just fucking anybody actually a sign that things are going pretty bad. <laughs> if you're willing to just vomit your life story onto just about anyone, that's not, you're not doing well. That's not, you, you, those boundaries are completely gone. You, you aren't managing your, your, your safe spaces. And if you're not managing your safe spaces, you're opening yourself up to harm. So, so I talk. Why do I fucking talk like that? One of, okay. Eric Gentry. Did a lot of Eric Gentry trainings. He, I recently did a recertification with Eric Gentry. So, and, and he says that you're allowed to reference him as much as you want. So I will. Relaxation in the body is relaxation in the mind. To process through a traumatic or grief experience, to let go, this is, this is the key. This is everything. To let go, you need to be in a physical space to do so not not location not not even orientation to person place thing that's that's very fucking important but that's not what i'm talking about a relaxed body is a relaxed mind if you are carrying tension in your body if you are carrying you know the the, the body keeps the score if you are in any way dysregulated if you are with people and they are dysregulated by what you are telling them when you are telling your story that is only going to add to the trauma it's only gonna make things worse if you're talking to someone yeah you're talking congratulations great job if their reaction is fucking crazy <laughs> They're not going to be the, they're, it's not going to help you. It's going to traumatize you to talk about what you're going through. And it's going to make everything worse for you because then you're not going to want to talk about it again. You need a therapist who can regulate themselves. You need friends who could regulate themselves. You need to know where they fit. You need to set those boundaries because you need regulated people to have these conversations. If you have these conversations with dysregulated people, you are going to make yourself worse. They, I don't use the word cure. I don't believe in curing things. I don't believe in proving things either. It's the science in me. What our evidence demonstrates is that you can reverse a significant amount of the traumatic injury associated with PTSD if you are able to regulate yourself physically and have that basis of regulation and that basis of you know calm body calm mind before engaging in any type of narrative work jumping straight to narrative work is damage and I know a lot of people who <sighs> I worked as a DBT clinician there are people who tout mindfulness. Mindfulness is very important. Mindfulness is great if you're doing, you know, John Kabat-Zinn mindfulness. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of things billed as mindfulness that aren't actually mindfulness skills. And just kind of bullshit. And are just distractions. And when you're doing something that is escapist, 
then that is reactionary. Escapism is reactionary. Dist you know, I had a friend who I, I would get so frustrated with her because she would talk about, you know, oh, I, I, I can't use these coping skills because that's just distracting from the problem. It's not solving the problem. And it's like, yeah, but you're super dysregulated. You need to do something to distract from the problem. So, so there's, you need to be able to differentiate. There's, there's a difference between something that is, you know, calling it a distraction isn't fair. There's something that's, you know, a difference between coping and escapism. Escapism is the one you want to avoid. Coping skills, you know, that's your tool belt. Why would you, why would you go to, to build a house without a tool belt? So, so this is the tool belt I'm hopefully giving you. Letting go is all about setting those boundaries. One. Two, regulating yourself. You need to regulate your body because you cannot talk about it. Talking about it isn't going to do shit unless you are able to talk about it in a safe way and with safe people. And here's number three. And this is going to be my last bit because this is long. A symptom of depression. One of the most classic symptoms of depression is anhedonia. Anhedonia is the, the so he, hedonism, a, a hedonism, anhedonia, is, you know, the inability to draw pleasure. So my number three, <laughs> my all too important number three, what time is it? Yeah, shit. My all too important number three. Anhedonia robs you of being able to find pleasure in the things that you normally do. So if you are a writer, you suddenly can't write. If you are somebody who plays sports, you no longer have interest in sports. If you're, it, it's, 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 it's the color draining out of life. And it is, you know, so many people interpret depression to be sadness. And what it really is, is emptiness. It is, it is blankness. It is a lack of being able to find meaning. You know, David Kessler talks about, if you move beyond Kubler Ross into into the the sixth stage, I think it is. I don't remember. It's, a, it's five stages of grief. So the sixth stage, per David Kessler, is finding meaning in your situation. So when you are trying to let go, and you are experiencing this anhedonia, because you can't imagine moving on from what it is you're experiencing. You can't imagine life different from how it is currently like literally physically you cannot imagine it when you were in that state because whether you're talking about an abusive relationship or the loss of someone or you know I, there's this really amazing grief exercise that i i can't even remember who taught it to me it was so long ago but when you're i, I have a friend who works in palliative care and when you're sitting with someone who is dying trying to you know you they're they they could be unconscious they could be whatever trying to remember the sensation of being in a room with them and doing nothing. Trying to remember this is just what it was like to be next to them is such a powerful way to call to mind and and you know if you're if you have a person who is dying if you're able to do that that's wonderful to you know you know kind of commit it to memory like create that that stronghold memory. To say, like, this is what it was like when they were here. Because you're going to need to find those pockets of space for yourself to let go. And whether you're dealing with grief and you're trying to let go of that person. And you're trying to be like, this is what they were like. This is what, you know, this is what it was like to be in a room with them. Versus... You know, if you're trying to get away from someone. If you're in an abusive situation and you're trying to, you know, let go of... You know, this this person who was so influential and controlling over your life, finding onto what was it like to be in a room with me? What am I really like? And, you know, it it's something that you have to sit with. And it's one of the most agonizing, stupid parts of the whole process is sitting with yourself. And a lot of people say platitudes 
a lot of people are like, oh, you know, you must, you must, you must sit with your emotions and experience your emotions. Jack Cornfield tells stories about how he was so fucking angry when he was all with all these monks, and the monks said, oh, good, you're angry, wonderful. Um, <laughs> it, it's true. You have to sit with it. Being angry is great. But you, you mean, you know, go sit in your hut. You're not Jack Cornfield. You're not necessarily going to get to just sit in a hut and and do it all on your own in a weekend or whatever the fuck you did. I'm sure it took him years. I'm, not, I'm sure he's still angry sometimes. <laughs> he's a human being. But it's, it's one of those things where you have to look at your emotions and say, good, I'm having emotions. Because if you were truly depressed, you wouldn't. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to identify them. You wouldn't be able to to say I am having this experience. So that's the that's the way to wheedle yourself in is to say this is the experience I'm having. It's not who I am. It is the experience that I'm having. It is right now. And that links into that mindfulness. This is what is happening right now. I am facing it non-judgmentally. I am not engaging with it. It's just what it is. Tomorrow it will be something different. Five minutes from now it'll be something different. Two seconds from now, it might be something different. It might be the same, but this is what it is. And it's it helps at that point to have a guide. It helps at that point to have, you know, some sort of practice or discipline that you can focus yourself into. Um, but you're gonna have to have your own thing, and that's how you let go. Because you have to experience it for it to end. If you keep delaying the experience you're going to, it's not going to go away. And it, it has to do with inappropriate affect. So when you are going through a grieving process and you've sublimated it, you won't allow yourself to experience it. You aren't allowing yourself to get through it. And you are suddenly triggered. You might start laughing. Or you might start crying. Or you... Blah, 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 blah. You don't know. You're going to have a strong emotional reaction to something that seems completely unrelated. Because you have so buried your ability to process that grief and to allow yourself those emotions that your body is going to take whatever outlet it can. Because it's it's screaming to be to be let go. Someone just pulled their car up next to me. They're in for a rude awakening. I'm gonna I'm gonna therapize at them if they stare at me. Don't stare at me. I challenge you. Now look at it. But so those are the steps. And it's not gonna happen linear. And it's not gonna happen in a weekend. And it's gonna be a process for the rest of your life. Congrats.